Hello, good morning. This is uh, Zach Model uh, with Atlas Toolworks. It's nice to be with you all uh, this morning at the RCAF convention here. Um, Bill asked me to come and give you all a little update, a brief update on U.S. manufacturing and trade. Uh, hopefully the first slide is up with the title block there, U.S. Manufacturing and Trade 2020 update. Um, so uh, I spoke to you last year, and you, you may remember me um, uh, when I visited and, and talked about my company, uh, the industry, uh, our history in the telecom manufacturing industry, and what was going on in manufacturing um, last year uh, when I spoke with you. Um, and I talked a little bit about the macroeconomics, the microeconomics, and, and some of the trade action that is going on uh, right now in the administration and, and uh, in Congress and how that was impact our industry. So today I'll give you a little bit of an update on, on some of the macro manufacturing issues. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the more recent trade actions and some of the impact that they're having on my industry. And then we'll wrap up talking a little bit about what else we can do to uh, help manufacturing. But I think, you know, um, I want to make a key point really before we get into this, that our industries are, are different but not that different. Uh, we are suffering from some of the same problems, and so I hope that by talking about these issues with you today, um, you'll learn a little bit about what's going on in our industry and that's, uh, that's helping a little bit and what kind of things we can keep doing, and perhaps some of those actions will mirror um, uh, in your industry, and you will see some hopefully uh, beneficial uh, 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 results if these things keep happening. So uh, if you'll switch to the next slide, please. Um, I want to show you some of the things we make at Atlas here. Um, last year I talked to you about our, our history. Um, uh, my company, we're a fourth generation manufacturing company. Uh, we're located just outside of Chicago and we were founded in 1918 by my great-grandfather. Um, over the years, we've had to evolve and change, and, and for about 80 of our first 100 years, we were very dedicated to the telecom industry. We really didn't need to look for another customer. We made metal brackets, covers, bus bars, enclosures, uh, items like that that held all the electronics for the phone switches that, that, that route all of our calls and internet traffic. And certainly before it was internet and, and before some of the new technologies that we enjoy today came out, you know, phones were switched mechanically. And, and so over the 80 years of being in that industry, we really in, enjoyed a lot of growth and, and, and uh, great employment profits. But you know, around 2000, when China came online, we watched that whole industry disappear. And that was enormously painful, as you can imagine, for our company. Uh, and, and it, but it wasn't just me. Uh, you know, my little company, we're just one of many, many, many in this country, uh, just like many of you are one rancher in, of many, many in this fine country. But you really, if you look at the macro trends and the micro trends, what happens to one rancher, what happens to one company is often mirrored in the macroeconomic data. And so I think my company is a good um, indicator of what happened in the whole industry and where all these millions of manufacturing jobs went. But what you see on the screen now, some of these items, so, so we had to pivot to new products. Uh, we primarily serve now the defense and medical industries, and you can see on the top left of the screen, those are some uh, chassis and frames that are going to become robots that are used to clean hospitals right now. And uh, in fact, some of our team members, if you can see them, are wearing masks as we're working to assemble and, and support that industry. You can imagine with the COVID outbreak, these UV disinfection devices are in high demand, so we're, we're fortunate to be busy with that. Some of the other items you see are uh, military uh, items. There's a targeting pod in the middle. Um, there's some testing equipment on the right. There's some electronics that goes in the Navy's P-8 uh, um, uh, submarine hunting aircraft and some other miscellaneous components. So we're primarily precision manufacturing. And again, um, we had to do this big pivot to aerospace, medical, and new industries when telecom left us. But I wonder, and this is the question that we should all be worried about, what, what happens when the industries that we pivoted to disappear? Because if we're only shopping on price, if, if, if all we care about is price and we don't care about jobs, manufacturing, employment, if all we care about is price, we will lose these industries. I, I talked to my customer, Boeing. The, the Chinese are flying their first single aisle jet right now. And believe me, it's, it's a knockoff of Boeing, number one. And number two, 
they'll undercut Boeing on price. Whatever price Boeing sells a plane for, the Chinese will sell it cheaper because they have no need to make a profit. They are subsidized by the communist government, and, and, and they can keep that game going for a long time. And we've seen what it's done, like I said, in the telecom industry. It put my customers out of business. It put every North American telecom manufacturer out of business. The industry we invented, the industry we designed, and all of the technology that came out of it, from the laser to the transistor to so many things came out of Bell Labs, so many things came out of telecom innovation, and we've let that go. And innovation doesn't just happen above the Great Plains. It is based on basic incremental manufacturing, basic incremental research, and it builds from there. So when you lose the basic manufacturing, when you lose the next level manufacturing, you lose the innovation as well, in my opinion. So as we talk here about, about what the trade actions are doing in my industry, keep in mind, we've lost so much, things are starting to come back, but if we don't keep this going, what else could we lose? There's an opportunity to, to improve, but there's also a cost if we don't do it right here. So if you'll please go to the next slide. Um, this shows some pictures I just wanted to share with you since I can't be there personally. Uh, maybe you'll remember my face there. But I, I want to urge you all, uh, you know, and in my introduction they mentioned I'm an advocate for the importance of domestic manufacturing, and that's why I'm here talking to you today. It's so important to get involved and talk. And whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, whether you're, you know, whatever side of the spectrum, whatever side of the issues you're on, you need to get involved and, and, and make your voice heard and advocate for the change you want to see. And, you know, I, I don't agree with all these people in some of these pictures that I've met with and talked with. I don't agree with them on every issue. But I always go and take the opportunity to speak with them. I always take the opportunity to politely explain my points and, and hope that they will listen. So I've had the opportunity to speak to a lot of people, and, and I think some of them are listening. So I would hope uh, I can encourage you all to do the same in your industry. I know Bill and RCAF, the whole team over there, does a great job advocating for, for uh, some of the things you need in terms of cool and other things, uh, you know, country of origin labeling. But, uh, you know, it's not just you can't just rely on your association. You've got to take the talking points and make sure you reach out to your legislators. Um, so the next slide, if you'll go to that, please, talk, um, starts to give you a little bit of the uh, macroeconomic data trends that we see here um, going on in my industry in manufacturing. And it's a pretty good picture. Uh, it could be better, but considering what's been going on in the world, uh, some, some good things are happening. And I think that these, what we see happening really adds weight to the fact that the trade actions that we're taking are working and we need to do more. We can see uh, the economy added um, 510,000 manufacturing jobs in, in the past three years. I mean, that's really phenomenal when you look at the trend where we were going. Um, but as I said, we still have a lot to go. We're, we're just coming up on 13 million. Boy, wouldn't it be great to get back to 17 million and then grow? You know, in the, in the 20 years when my teleco, this is a perfect example of what happened to my company. In the 20 years um, since telecom left, you know, for me, this, is, this, this chart pretty much shows exact, exactly what happened to my company as well. So, um, again, if we want these jobs to come back, and, and these jobs, this is, these are the jobs of the middle class. These are the consumers that we're missing. These are the good jobs in Ohio, the good jobs in Indiana, Illinois, all around the country that are missing. And, and what we see, the result of it, we see foreclosures. We see these deaths of despair. We see drug addiction, you know, families breaking up. These are because people don't have hope and they don't have pride and they don't have a job. And we told them all that you would find something better well, they haven't. That didn't pan out. They didn't find something better. So I'm so pleased that the administration has been taking some of these actions to make these changes. Um, you know, again, the highest manufacturing uh, in December of 2019 since 2008. But what really drove these changes and, and the economic growth that reached 3% in 2018? Well, um, the administration is very proud of their deregulation agenda, and, and I think they should be. It, it's for, for good reason. Um, the Tax Cuts uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act did have some stimulus effect. I s testified in favor of them. Um, I think they could have done more, and we, we could do more with the tax code to encourage more uh, production coming back to our country, but I think they were a good first step, and I think they did help. 
um, the oil and gas boom. I mean, you know, uh, all of that is driving uh, growth and, and GDP, but also, you know, if you think about it in, in manufacturing, like I make a lot of parts for the oil and gas industry, and I might make a little piece for a drill or a little part that goes in a, a downhole radar system. I'm one piece of a supply chain that feeds into that. So when that industry is booming, there are so many millions of us supporting that behind that boom. And then the big one, for me anyway, are tariffs. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into the next slides. But I, I think that the tariffs are, have been an important tool that have driven some of these changes. And when we look at some of the industry's specific changes, we'll see a little bit more why, why I say that. But the tariffs are not the only tool. They're kind of a blunt instrument. And, and they're kind of being used um, not in conjunction of a whole trade policy. They're kind of being used by themselves. And, and so that's great because it's what the president can do on his own. And he hasn't always had the support of Congress on <laughs> many issues. And, and quite frankly, I've been talking to Congress since 2000 for 20 years about these issues. And sometimes the Democrats are, are supporting these issues. Sometimes the Republicans are supporting these issues. But the problem is, the issues never advance. They, it switches teams and, and, and it switches sides, but they can never get together and, and, and advance these things and really put in a good comprehensive policy for America. So I'm pleased with the tariffs, but I think that they're just one tool in the toolbox. And so let's talk a little bit more about um, how the tariffs work and what other tools we can use. If you'll please go to the next slide um, about the steel tariffs boosting the steel industry here. Um, the 25% steel tariffs were some of the first things that came on. They were enacted in March of 2018. And it has had a positive impact on steel production in this country. Um, you can see it uh, uh, on, on the charts of capacity utilization. You can see it on the production charts. Now, most recently, we've, of course, had, had quite a fall off here in 2020, primarily due to COVID. And, and I think we'll see that bounce back as, as things get back to normal here. But as a manufacturer who uses steel, you know, I, I had a lot of inquiries from my friends. Why do you support these tariffs? Aren't you paying higher prices? The truth is no, I'm not. Uh, we saw a little bit of noise when the tariffs were first uh, enacted and, and prices kind of spiked and there was a little bit of a surge and, and there were some shortages. But for me, I've seen prices come back down and, and um, you know, the the uh, charts and the data show that prices are back to 2017 levels overall. Now, I'm sure there's still some people out there who are maybe having some shortages or some issues, but again, this is the short-term pain. You know, they, they told people to, oh, look for a better job, you'd find a better job. I, I didn't believe that one, but I do believe that if we work together through these things and we rebuild domestic manufacturing in steel, aluminum, and other industries, we will see any noise in the pricing, we will see any blip in the pricing normalize as the industry increases capacity, increases utilization, and we have more domestic competition. So I'm, I've been a big fan of the steel tariffs. And another thing that people asked about, about the steel and aluminum tariffs, they said to me, Zach, why, why are we putting tariffs on our allies? Why aren't we just going after the Chinese if they're the problem? Well, first of all, they're not just the only problem. We'll see that a little bit later in my slides. But it's if you have made a commitment, uh, those tariffs were put on for national security reasons. We need a steel industry. We need an aluminum industry. It's critical to everything in our daily lives, and especially in the defense industry, it's critical. So if you make a decision to have an industry that is critical to your country, it's not about friend or foe, buying it from friend or foe. It's not about that. It's about you're going to support it here no matter what. And so our friends in Canada or in other countries who were offended, it's not about you, it's about us. It's about making sure we have a healthy industry. And again, it wasn't just China. Um, you know, the Canadians have not been great about making sure things weren't transshipped through Canada. You know, people have been avoiding tariffs, moving things through other countries, through Mexico, Canada. Um, they, they can do more to protect that. And I think, again, the tariffs are, are helping, helping on our end control what we can control. If you'll please move to the next slide, um, the tariffs uh, regarding aluminum production here. Um, we saw a 43% increase in aluminum production since those tariffs went, went on. And, and uh, the president just enacted them again on, on, uh, on Canada here. Uh, they started, they had come off as part of some of the trade deal, but they were put back on. And again, for good reason. Look what's happening to capacity and utilization in the industry. You can see it. Um, they're expanding. They're hiring. 
We have more smelters in the U.S. Two, two new ones compared to five was the low. We used to have 40 in the 90s. In those times when my company was busy, when my peers were busy, when we were manufacturing all of those products. But you can see by 2000, when China came online there, uh, it, it just decimated the industry. And, um, you know, again, pricing. I have not seen huge increases in, in my aluminum pricing. Uh, in fact, we're buying more aluminum than ever before. We use it in those medical devices. We use it in the military products we make, everything from fighter jets to, to uh, uh, um, coat racks and things we, we're using alum aluminum in now. And I've not seen any significant increases in pricing. So again, I would support uh, the tariffs. And you know, again, even if I did see a slight increase in price, what is it worth to have a strong country? What is it worth to have uh, a national security? What is it worth to have jobs and employment where people can have pride in the work they do? You know, everybody says you, you, you go to college, get a better job. Mm, I, I don't know. I got guys and gals working for me that are making six figures, have no college degree, but they do have vocational training. They do have skills. You know, uh, so, so there's something to be said for that. And, and we are seeing a skill shortage in manufacturing as these things are coming back. So. I think that you need to have a job for everyone. Not everybody wants to go to college. Not everybody is suited for college. And, and many people who have gone to college, we're seeing this in the data and you see it in the news reports, they're not getting the job they thought they were gonna get, yet they are up to their eyeballs in debt that they will never pay back. I have friends in their mid 40s that have only begun to nibble down their college debt. They have two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars in college debts, and their job is paying them 40 grand a year. It didn't add up. So I think manufacturing, all these things, we provide good employment just as you do in your industry, good employment for hardworking people, and we need good uh, actions from Congress, from the administration, whoever is there, to, to support our industries and our American producers. Um, if you'll go to the next slide, please. Um, what I believe to be the biggest driver of our trade deficit is the overvalued dollar. And we spoke a little bit about this last year. It's really not gotten better. In fact, it, it, it's gotten worse. But, but we, we have some opportunities to improve. So, so I want to spend some time talking about this um, and how, how it works. You know, uh, like you've seen, we've run a trade deficit for, for 44 years. And I believe my colleague, Michael Stumo, uh, spoke to you uh, uh, yesterday about some of these issues here and, and, and why persistent everlasting trade deficits are bad for America. Essentially, we're hollowing out our wealth. We're, we're, we're bar borrowing from our future. But when countries do that, their currency should, should drop. That's the problem here. We have this trade deficit, but the dollar keeps going up. It's lost its connection to, to uh, things. And, and why is that? It's because all these um, capital inflows, and probably Michael spoke to you in depth about this, so I won't, I won't get too much, but foreign countries, uh, hedge funds uh, outside, you know, it's insurance companies in Singapore, all of these people have a need for excess capital to find a productive use for it. And the best and safest place in the world to invest it is in America. So the stock market keeps going up, more money gets pumped in the global economy. There is an excess of capital and it keeps coming here and it keeps driving up the dollar. It just keeps making the trade deficit worse. It's a vicious cycle and it's harming every producer, every sector that produces farming, ranching, manufacturing, mining. We are all being harmed by this. And so what can be done uh, uh, to, to support it? Well, uh, Michael probably talked to you about uh, the, the market access charge, the MAC. This is in the last two bullet points there. Um, uh, Senator, uh, and I spoke to you a little bit about this last year, too. It's kind of like a peak load charge on electricity. When it's a 100-degree day and everybody's got their air conditioners running and, and the power company is, is worried about a brownout, they don't cut off your power. They charge you more for it. And so that's kind of, and that helps slow down demand and that helps uh, regulate things and keep the grid healthy in most instances, uh, California not, with, <laughs> not included. But uh, so, so, so the same thing with the market access charge. When too many dollars are flowing into the country, the Federal Reserve would have a tool to help um, make it just a little more expensive and, and to dissuade the demand, to reduce the demand um, for, for dollars that would help bring our dollar back to a level that would balance trade. So, you know, if, if we could get back to balanced trade, that's where those 5 million manufacturing jobs are. 
that's where the demand is for you know a lot of products in, in America. You know, if consumers are doing better, they'll buy more and they can afford to pay a premium price for things. So, so really, I believe this trade deficit and the overvalued dollar are the root of, of most of the evils in, in in our country in manufacturing right now, particularly. And um, this combined with tariffs would be a much smarter approach. The tariffs would 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 uh, have less pain, less impact for some people, and and could be used more strategically. This is the big elephant in the room. So um, I, I hope that uh, you'll look a little bit more into this. There's a, a Senator Baldwin uh, from Wisconsin and, and Josh, Senator Howley from Missouri, a great bipartisan team, have introduced the market access charge in the Senate August 2019. Unfortunately, it's kind of languished has not gotten a lot of attention. This is kind of a, a nerdy, wonky issue. And, and we have heard, um, you know, I, I think that the president and his team get it and they support this. Uh, we've heard a little bit from, from his challenger, from, from Biden's team. You know, I'm not sure if they get it, but we have heard a little bit of talk from some of his team about capital controls, and that's really what this is. So I hope that whoever you talk to, um, Tell them about the baldwin Holly bill. Tell them about the overvalued dollar and how it's harming producers. And, and tell them that there is a solution with, this, with these capital controls, the market access charge. It will help all of us. And, and if you'll go to the next slide, this is where it really uh, comes down in the data. You can see on the next slide where we're talking about U.S. runs trade deficits with most major trading partners. Like I said, it's not just China. Mexico, US, uh, the EU, Japan, it, it's, it's nearly everyone that we trade with. And, and, and many of them have a much smarter approach than what we do. In fact, all of them do. Our country is the only country that I'm aware of in the world that has no comprehensive national strategy to support manufacturing, none at all. The last time we had one was with Alexander Hamilton. I mean, it, it's, it's unbelievable since the, since the 1700s we haven't had a plan in manufacture, to support manufacturing in this country, and all these other countries do. We heard about Japan. Uh, they're, they're even paying money. I'm not sure I support this, but it, it's an interesting approach, and, and it certainly shows that they're at least thinking about it. They're paying money to bring companies back to their country. It, 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 it's very, from China. Very interesting. Um, but, you know, uh, th this trade deficit, again, you can see the tariffs imposed on China. Let's look at that in 2019. Look what happened there. They work. It's there in the data. That's it. You know, you, you see it happening here. And how can it really help? How can it break down into other industries? If you if you'll go to the next slide here, please, uh, the CPA reshoring index. Um, the Coalition for Prosperous America uh, and, and Michael may have talked a little bit about this as well. Uh, we actually showed a slight increase in reshoring in 2019. And where I want to really point, if you look at the data chart that we have here, manufacturing import penetration, there's a kind of a brown reddish color for machinery, if you see that. Look at that line. Uh, I make a lot of parts that go into machinery as well and, and, and in that code. And um, chapter 84, I believe, is, is the tariff code. That particularly was one that everybody was freaking out about. This is everything from parts for copy machines, parts for washing machines, parts for custom machines that make food products, uh, you know, Wrigley chewing gum, you know, they'll make five custom machines. Well, my company is going to make parts and pieces that go into those machines. And so this, this tariff code, the increase that we see right there, the increase that we see in the next tariff code, motor vehicle bodies, trailers, and parts uh, down there, that, that bluish line, those are, I think, the ones that you really want to zero in on to show that these tariffs are working and they're bringing jobs back. Unfortunately, uh, in other industries, you know, apparel, uh, computer electronics products, um, you know, even in finished motor vehicles, you know, the pendant, the it's up, you know, the imports are still coming. So we've seen some improvement here, particularly in 2019. I think we're going to see some more improvement even in 2020, although there's going to be noise from the COVID crisis in the data. But the tariffs are working, and, and they're bringing jobs back. They're bringing industry back. So if we keep them going and if we keep doing more things, like managing our dollar better um, and some other uh, uh, actions, we can really help jobs in America. We can help our productive capacity. If you go to the last slide, the summary uh, page, please. Um, again, we talked about the growth in manufacturing, how the tariffs are working, 
Um, we have reduced our dependence on China, but that dollar overvaluation is still there. That's the biggest thing. And if we can get these capital flows to get the dollar to a competitive level, level, it will it will help uh, manage our deficits and our growth. But um, the last point, number nine, is where I want to talk a little bit more. Um, this industrial strategy piece is really what's missing here. I think, again, tariffs done by themselves, um, dollar realignment done by itself. As I mentioned, I'm already, my company's getting busier. Many of my peers are getting busier. Um, those of us that survived this horrible 20 year period uh, have a great opportunity in front of us. But the thing we're lacking also is skilled workforce right now. I, I've had, I hired 24 people. Uh, when in, in, in the 2017 2018 time frame and in the 2019 to 20 uh, 20 time frame i hired 30 people now my company currently employs a little over 80 people so not everybody has stayed typically after they we we hire them they stay on for a year and if they make it through the first year they're going to be with us for 20 years but so so about half of those people that we've hired in, in both years left and about half stayed but we still have job openings I got many job openings that I can't fill, and 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 it's for these skilled positions, these highly skilled, these programming positions, and these are positions that don't require a college degree, but they require years of of, of hands-on training, and they require before that typically some schooling and vocational training and classes, and so if we if we bring back uh, jobs or if we make the dollar competitive and 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 we we have tariffs and we bring all these things back, but we don't have the workforce to support us. We're not going to help ourselves at all. We're still going to be in trouble. We're still not going to get the jobs back. So, again, you can't do any of these things in a vacuum. They need to be looked at in a total comprehensive strategy, and I hope that um, the next administration really takes uh, that up uh, loudly. I hope that the next Congress really takes that up. There have been bills passed. I've testified in support of some of them in the past. Um, under the Obama administration, uh, there was a bill passed to have a National Manufacturing Strategy Act, and they let it linger. They were supposed to give reports and do things. Nothing ever happened. It sat there. So hopefully the next administration, the next Congress will, will take this seriously, continue some of the trade actions that are going on here that are helping our industries, helping our jobs in our country, and, and do so in a comprehensive way. Um, I'm, that, that pretty much wraps up what I had to say for, for you all today, and I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any there. And uh, I know I think I'm probably the last thing between you and lunch, and, and we're running a little late, so hopefully uh, this is a good thing to get you back on schedule. But anyway, I would love to hear some questions. Hey. Oh, there we go. Does anybody have any questions for Zai? You mentioned the dollar's overvalued, and uh, is there any pressure at all being put on the Federal Reserve to realign the value of the dollar lower to make us more competitive? Um, unfortunately, not really, no. They don't currently have a mandate to worry about the dollar's value, and that's what the market access charge would do in part. It would give them a mandate to regulate it and to keep it at a trade balancing level. So no, they don't have any incentive to manage it now. They don't do it now. And in fact, Wall Street types, stock market types, many of the types in, in, in that industry <laughs> and, and who have r risen through the ranks to, to become the regulators or at the Federal Reserve or wherever, they uh, see it just the opposite, that a strong dollar is good for America. They don't get, for some reason, the connection has not, I mean, they know it, but, but perhaps maybe the reason they choose to ignore the connection is that they're making a lot of money by ignoring it. Um, you know, they like the stock market to keep going up, whether it has any uh, ties to reality. You know, they like the dollar that keep going up. That, that makes, uh, you know, companies that are, have aligned their supply chains to buy cheap products overseas and bring them here and sell them to us even more profitable. When the dollar is up against other currencies, all those little bits and pieces and parts and assemblies that they're bringing in from overseas and selling to you here, they keep getting more profitable. So it incentivizes them to buy more things elsewhere. The dollar keeps going up. It, it keeps making their supply chain costs go down, and they keep selling them to you at the same price and keeping the difference. So, so there is a lot of incentive to not do it. So, so in answer to your question, no, they're not doing it now, but hopefully we can keep pressuring them and we can get if not this bill, another bill passed that will do something to help them regulate the dollar's value. Okay, um, got another question. There's a conspiracy theory out there, I hope it's true, that Trump is going to eliminate the Federal Reserve, phase it out, 
and replace it with gold standard. What would that do for all the issues you've been talking about? Yeah, that's an interesting question, and uh, perhaps one I'm not fully uh, prepared to answer, but I, I have heard about that. Um, I think there would be some positives to it. Uh, I'm not sure how it would impact the dollar. I, I certainly wouldn't want it to I, I see the benefits of it, and, and I know people. a lot of people are worried about this printing of money, and, and, and like I said, there's this global oversupply of money. Um, I recently, and, and I used to worry a lot about that too, and I used to really be, uh, you know, I consider myself a fiscal conservative. I worried about overspending, about deficit, about printing money. I've recently gotten some new education showing me that these don't matter as much as we think, especially in a world that's competing like this. When everyone else is pumping money and printing money, if we cut off the pump, we're only cutting off our own nose despite our face. So I don't know if going back to the gold standard would do that, and I certainly wouldn't want to do it if it would shoot the dollar up even higher. Um, but if it would help manage it at, at a trade balancing level and 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 control some of this um, this excess capital flows, I would be in favor of that. I would think it's a good thing. This question is related to that last one, and uh, what would the uh, relationship be with the tremendous deficit interest rates and the value of the dollar? Well, again, aren't we in a curious world? Interest rates keep going down and down and down. The deficit keeps growing. These things shouldn't be happening. They shouldn't be happening under traditional economic rules. Uh, the disconnect is, is extraordinary. And the fact that traditional economists and people at the Fed and, and power, I, I, they must see this as a problem. They must understand how the system is broken. But I think it's just working for their benefit and the benefit of their people that they don't really care. So, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm less worried, you know, again, uh, more re I'm more worried about fixing the trade deficit than I am the federal deficit. I think the two things will ultimately fix themselves, but if we fix the trade deficit first, and if that takes some money to do, perhaps infrastructure spending, a strong Buy America provision in infrastructure spending. I mean, I'd love to see an infrastructure bill that truly required Buy American, because I mean, I'm involved in making these parts and pieces for these companies, and I know how they work the system to avoid as much as possible these clauses. So if we could really have that and really get the trade deficit down, I think we would see um, the result in wages, income taxes, other taxes, consumption type taxes, sales taxes, I think we'll see things add up the right way. But I'm not as worried about the deficit as I used to be. Uh, um, so I, I hope I've, I've answered your, your question. I think right now what's more important is getting jobs, employment, and protecting our position in national security in a world where there are many actors around us, particularly China, who do not share our interests and really don't like us. And you know, our way of life, people can criticize it, I've traveled a lot, been to a lot of countries. While we are not perfect, I think it's the but we are the best country in the world. And our way of life, in my opinion, is the way I want to live. I don't want to live the way they do in China, and I don't want China to set the tone for the world for the next hundred years. So, so if that costs some money, if that makes the federal deficit grow, I think it's a fight we have to have. This is the existential fight of our lifetimes, in my opinion. M Mr. Mr. Model, can you hear yes. me? Uh, yes, I'm here. Th this is kind of tangential, but you're, you as an employer and a business owner, wh what do you think about worth it, work ethic? Uh, the people in this room, you know, we're grounded in work ethic. We've taught our kids and our grandkids, but the people that come to you for employment, you say you, wh what do you think about work ethic uh, in the labor force uh, that we need to recreate? Can you talk about uh, the new generation. What are we going to do about work ethic in our younger generation? That's a great question. <laughs> it is tangential, but it's one that I care about uh, a lot, and, and I struggle with. And you know, I, I watch what I see going on here in my little world, and, and, and sometimes I just shake my head. You know, I, I'm a person who values personal liberty and personal responsibility. I say what I do. I do what I say. If I make a commitment, I'm going to be there. And and you know, I'm I'm I like to think I'm relatively young. I guess people would say I'm middle aged. I'm in my 40s and stuff. But you know, uh, hiring uh, the new people that we come in, we it is a problem. Uh, the cart, you know, I see a lot of times the well, you know, they want to make a lot of money, but they don't have a lot of experience. 
And so I try to counsel them, you have the opportunity to make the money you want, but n not yet. <laughs> You're not valuable yet. For at least the first year when I hire somebody, typically it costs me money <laughs> while we're training them and teaching them. They make mistakes. They screw things up. They create scrap. You know, they, 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 they just don't have the skills yet. So if we get past the work ethic issue of just getting to work on time, first of all, that, that, that's sometimes a problem in about I've seen it sometimes in about half the candidates. Then we have the issue of um, are, are you, you know, why, why they, they want to get bonuses, they want to get paid, they get disgruntled and frustrated quickly because they haven't gotten the rewards as fast as they think. And I guess this is part of the conditioning of the world we live in here with the, you can get your food immediately, you can post your pictures on your Facebook page or whatever, your friends can love them immediately. It's all so instantaneous. The feedback, the gratification, it's all so fast and so positive. People have forgotten that good things take a long time. Your career development takes a long time. And, and, and it's not just the work ethic, but I see this switching. You know, People have been told so much to jump around and switch careers. I don't know. I don't advocate that. You know, I, I work in my family business, so I've never gone anywhere. But uh, other people, you know, I see them switch, and, and I've seen my friends keep jumping and jumping. And at some point, the, the bottom falls out from them. They don't get where they were going because you never got the experience, the skill. You never climbed the ladders in, in the traditional way. So, so I think we need to get back to valuing a long-term career in an industry that you hone your skills and get really good at and become an expert in instead of a jack-of-all-trades and an expert in none. That's kind of what we've seen. And, and as far as the work ethic of, of, of you know, the next generation getting them to come to work, I, I think that I see some positive things in, 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 in my family and in my friends and the younger kids that I interact with, the, 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 maybe not the kids in high school and college, but the eighth graders or grade schoolers. I think they see what's going on and they're getting a little sick of it. I think this COVID thing has created some – I never remember up until recently when kids were begging to go back to school. I can't tell you how many kids I've run into that are just dying to get back to work and go back to school. So perhaps there is a little lesson learned in that generation right now about they're burned out on their screens. They're burned out clicking on things. They want to be productive. They want to be useful again. And I, and I think if we get back to having that pride of production, not just having things handed to you, but like you said, in your industry, you have a lot of hardworking people who are hopefully, probably very proud about the product that they produce, and you should be. And that's a blessing. That's the wonderful thing in life, having a purpose. And, and whether you have a religious connotation to it or not, it's important. You, you, we have a purpose, and so find it, thrive at it, and you will have a rewarding life. And, and how we get that message to the next generation, I, maybe you know better than I do, but I have seen the problem in my workforce. It's been hard. And, and, and the last generation that's hanging on, I've got people that are ready to retire that I keep convincing to stay on another year, another year. I'm trying to find them an apprentice and teach them. I'm, try, you know, I'm trying to find them an apprentice to pass their skills on. But one year is not enough to pass on skills. It's many years. So we've had some positive things with apprentices. We've had had some positive steps, but we've also had some that haven't worked out, and uh, unfortunately, it's been about 50-50 right now, so that's not a real good track record if you want to have a great workforce and, and a great productive country. So hopefully, hopefully, things are going the other direction, and people are starting to see that, and the pendulum is swinging the other way. Zach, this is Bill Clark. I don't know if you remember me or not. I'm always asking you questions, but... Uh... I, I recently moved this spring from one ranch up to the another one that it was, you know, it's only 20 miles an hour away, but in the process of moving all the paperwork and stuff, I run across where I had sold uh, my coal cows in 1987, and uh, I received 68 cents a pound at that time. And last fall in 2019, I sold uh, coal cows and got 62 cents for them. My, my evaluation of that is the importation of this cheap beef that come from Zambia and Mexico and every place else has driven down the coal, coal price so bad, and that's about a third of the income for the ranch, uh, that, that that's killing me really bad. And, and if that doesn't relate to the trade deficit, I don't know what does. No, you're absolutely right, and I do remember you, Bill. It's good to hear from you again. I wish I was seeing you face to face. Uh, that is a great example. I mean, it, and you're not even talking adjusted dollars, I'm assuming. You're just giving me the price. You're not even adjusting for inflation or anything else. I mean, it's horrible. 
that's a horrible trend. But you're right. And so that overvalued dollar, all those big meat packers that you all know about there, they love buying that imported beef. Not only can they get it cheaper if, because there's less controls and less quality and everything else there, but when the dollar keeps going up, those things keep seeming cheaper and cheaper. And, and the inputs in Mexico, the things they buy, the things they buy or in Zambia or wherever to take care of their cattle herd, uh, keep appearing, you know, uh, keep helping them lower their costs compared to what you pay here in, in, in when you get it denominated in dollars. So, so again, it, it is a problem. It is part of the trade deficit, and you are exactly right. This system has become perverted. That's what it is. The system is perverted. When it was 68 cents in 87 and 62 cents in 2019, something is broken here. And so Federal Reserve, action on the dollar, action on trade. I think your industry is, is, is I don't know why, you don't have country of origin labeling other than that horrible WTO, but thank God for the president, uh, his actions on that. So let's hope that we get some country of origin labeling, because I know that in your industry, I certainly want to pay, I would prefer to buy American beef and I would pay a premium for it. Just like I prefer to buy American aluminum and American steel. If it costs me a, a, a few cents more, it's worth it for the jobs. It's worth it for our country. So I, I hope that we, you start seeing these, these numbers move in the right direction in the next four years.